Last night we saw history, y'all. The Detroit Pistons lost their 27th straight game. That is the longest NBA streak of most consecutive losses. And, and I say that aloud, and I've been thinking about it for the past 12 hours or so, and I still can't really wrap my head around it because it makes zero sense. ESPN has this picture of the three teams with the longest streaks. Obviously, you see the 27 straight losses from this year's Pistons. We have 26 from the 2013-2014 76ers and 26 from the 2010-2011 Cavs. This is so weird because this team, this Pistons team, have more talent, at least on paper. I can't say that now that they lost 27 in a row. On paper, they have more talent than maybe both of these two teams can bind. Like, look at this 76 a team that lost by design, first of all. This is the first year of, of Sam Hinkie trusting the process. They just traded away Drew Holiday for Norris Noel and so on and so forth. They won a total of 19 games this year under Brett Brown. But, like, again... They had so many different people suiting up. They had eight different rookies this year. Eight different. And 23 different players played in the jersey. This Like, again, by design, this team was purposefully really, really bad. The Cavaliers team was really bad as well under Byron Scott. 19 total wins. But th this is a team that just lost LeBron James. They lost LeBron James. They didn't trade him away. They literally lost him and it kind of shows how impactful LeBron can be with a previous season. They won 61 games and pretty much the same roster other than LeBron came back and they won uh, 19. Uh, and I mean that too. Like uh, Tuan was still there, Verizal, Mo Williams, Anthony Parker, and J.J. Hickson. All of these guys were like top end rotation dudes for LeBron the previous season. And they all played, well not all, but they, they played a good amount of games and they won 19, 19 games. But again, this Pistons team was expected to be a lot better than this. Some people thought they could make a play-in push. Obviously, that's out the door. But this team, again, when you think about them having a former first overall pick of K Cunningham, at least I got to top my, my cap to K because he's dropped 240 pieces in the last week trying to get his team in the right direction. Now, obviously, guys like Bojan and then Jalen Duran have missed significant time. But even then, I, I, again, internalized with 27 straight losses. Think about that. We're not talking about them just being bad. We're talking about them being the worst team in the history of the NBA right now. And this roster does not look like a team that should be the worst of all time, especially when the coach is the highest paid coach in the history of the sport. And, and the reason why it's, it's super, super surprising is that the way the NBA is right now, you can win a game here, there, by just having some really, really good shooting. I'm not trying to tear down what the Bulls have built over the last three to four weeks or so, but when they were hot, hot, they were shooting 50% from three, four, five game stretch. It's unsustainable. It's insustainable? Unsustainable amount of shooting. But some of those games, they shot lights out and they won those games. You're trying to tell me in almost two months time, the Pistons haven't had one game where somebody in their team shot lights out or a combination where, oh man, they just can't miss tonight. It didn't happen one time? Or how about the exact opposite? Where somebody they're going against just had the worst shooting night of their careers. It didn't happen once. Last night was as close as they've ever been. Uh, the, the Brooklyn Nets left the door wide open, and they were they did not capitalize. Like, look, look at this shot. Down by five, 40 seconds to go. Of course, you need a quick bucket, and this is what we get. Alec Burks, heavily contested three. Was Alec Burks on a burner? No, he was having another inefficient game. Cade had 40, and that is a shot we get when we need a bucket. It is inexcusable. You know who's also inexcusable? Speaking of Alec Burks, and again, I'm ranting from the perspective, I'm not a fan of this team. I just cannot believe how bad it's really got. Like, there's actual parity in the NBA where, for the most case, I can tune into a game with two teams. One team can be the top of their conference. The other team can be middle of the pack or towards the bottom of the conference. And I can't say 100% certain that the top of the conference team is going to win in, in most cases. The only case where that's not it is with this team, the Detroit Pistons, the San Antonio Spurs, and then the Washington Wizards. But at least the Spurs and the Wizards are somewhat frisky here, though. This Pistons team is not that. Alec Burks, back to it, had 26 minutes last night and was awful the entire time. I know he's a vet in the locker room. He, you know, he's been in the league for 12 years. Uh, historically, he's been a decent role player, decent shooter. Here are his season averages. Nine points. 32% from three, 32% from 
from the field. This this brother should not be playing 25, I'm sorry, 26 minutes in a winnable game. And look at this, the win probability. They had a chance, bro. They had a chance. They were up by five or eight minutes to go and they completely, completely collapsed and they ended up losing by how much? By six. They, this is like the best win probability chart they've seen in these 26 games. I ain't even going to fact check. I'm just going to say that as a fact. They had a 71% chance of winning with eight minutes left, and they blew the game. And obviously, this goes deeper than just this season. This is the season where they're at the bottom of the barrel. But when you, when you talk about Trey Weaver coming and taking over the team, that was four years ago, y'all. He has been in control of the team for four years. If, if any other team had this type of control from... Was it Tom Gores and Troy Weaver of year four of the rebuild and you're the worst team of all time? Everybody would have been fired. They would have cleaned houses in most cases. A rebuild should see some growth by year two, year three, and year we're in year four and this is the worst they've ever looked. They have one above 500 seasons since Barack Obama's first term. The beginning of Barack Obama's first term. MySpace was the leading platform for social media. And they have one winning season since then. Like, I, again, I feel for Pistons fans. And this is why I've made, well, I think three different Detroit Pistons videos over the course of the seasons. A, it's, again, I can't really compute the lack of success, but also I feel for the fan base where they've had years in my lifetime where they were really good. They have a championship in my lifetime where I remember watching the finals games. And now they can't even scratch a 500 record. They can't even scratch a 20% win percentage right now. They are 2 and 20 Eight. It makes zero sense. And then uh, Tom Gores, I think that's his name. I, I, maybe I shouldn't remember his name because he should be selling the team soon. Shout out to the fans for chanting that over the last couple home games. Uh, they mentioned, oh, we're not going to sit on our hands and let this be the case. We're going to be making some adjustments. But, like, if you look at... This is from Shams. Um, Detroit Pistons are actively looking for a four-man Spoiler, y'all should be looking for one through fives and then five through tens too, because it, it's, it's, it's real bad. I'm told some names to keep an eye on are Pascal Siakam, OG Ananobi, Tobias Harris, and Miles Bridges. What do all of those players have in common? At least I think with Miles Bridges, I'm not looking up his contract. They're all expiring deals. So again, I know you have to fix something. You can't lose uh, 80 straight games or whatever it might end up being. But if you're trying to make the adjustments and you're trading for people on the last year of their deal and you're simultaneously right now the worst ran organization in all the sport, the worst team in all of the sport, how can you convince Pascal Siakam, OG, I know Tobias Harris or Miles Bridges to stay around after this season? But again, I understand that you need to do something, but it's like, hey, everybody go. Hey, everybody go. Don't just think about these four players. Try to bring in a whole new team. You remember that one year with the Cavaliers where it felt like they traded away every single person at the deadline to, to try to make a last uh, finals push? Do that. Trade everybody. No, I'm being extreme. But but that's, that's what it feels like right now because there's no cohesion. There's no nothing. This actually just made me think of like some statistics and stuff. Like how many clutch games have they really been in? And I think for the most part, clutch is defined as like a X amount of point game with five minutes to go. Five, minute, five point game with five minutes to go. Something like that. They've played 13 clutch games, and hell, they got one win. And I think that one win is against the Bulls when Zach Levine had 50. So they played a total of 33 minutes. In the clutch, they have an offensive rating of 63. 63? No, let me see. 63 is the worst in the Wizards. Are not. The Wizards just got their first clutch win of the season like a week or so ago. Um, and then the... A net rating of minus 60. Somehow that's better than the Pistons. Or that's better than the Wizards. But for them to be in clutch games 13 times a season, only have one win, and have an offensive rating of 63. I don't even again, I don't even know how to internalize that number. That is the lowest I've ever seen in under any circumstance. For, for, refer for reference, the Indiana Pacers, who are top of the, the list, have a 130. So they over doubled the offensive production in clutch times <laughs> compared to the Pistons. Oh, that's kind of, that's really, really crazy. I've been seeing a lot of people try to have a conversation of who's at fault, who's at fault, who's at fault. And obviously there is a hierarchy of fault, right? Uh, ownership should probably at the top of the list. Um, but everybody deserves, there, there's not a single person on the roster. There's not a single person in the organization. The ball boy, 
the the trainer, athletic staff, everybody is at fault one way or another. I'm sorry, not the ball boy. He doing his job. He doing his job. It ain't like the ball boy that Wimby stepped on, because um, <laughs> he would have been a problem in, in San Antonio. Um, but it's just crazy to really think about. And now I was just on FanDuel TV, and they asked me, could this go to 30? And the answer is absolutely, it could. They got the they got the Celtics tomorrow. I bet that the line of that game is probably crazy. They got the Raptors, and this, the Raptors are not playing good basketball at, at this current moment in time. So I, it's possible, but, but the Raptors don't want to be that team. Nobody wants to be that team. They even mentioned—I forgot who what the player who the player was. They mentioned we don't want to be the team, and it makes sense. They got the Rockets, and they have the Jazz again. Again, they played against the Jazz a couple nights ago. They lost by eight. And they, the, the Jazz did not have four starters. So you continue to go down his list. They got the Spurs January 10th. If you go from, no, what was it, November 12th to January 10th without a... I ain't got nothing else to say. 